Genesis chapter 32, and I want to pick up reading uh, with verse 24. Genesis 32, verse 24. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hallow of his thigh, and the hallow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel, who is a prince, hath thou power with God, and with men, and hath prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And he passed over Peniel. The sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. Therefore, the children of Israel eat not of the sinews which shrank, which were upon the hollow of the thigh until this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that shrank. May the Lord's rich blessing be to his red word, and may it be sanctified in our hearts. Let us pray together. Shall we, Father, we're so grateful another glorious day you bless us to see. We pray that you would uh, indeed bless us. You open your word uh, to us, that we might see glorious, magnificent, and splendid truth, and that we might be changed from one glory to the next, to be conformed, to be more like our Lord and Savior, your darling Son, Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, bless our time together around your word, Father. In Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Uh, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to speak this morning from our series of catching a fresh vision, view, and glimpse of God. And this is part two of a message we began on last week about Jacob. This morning we want to talk from the subject of a crook wins a wrestling match with God. A crook wins a wrestling match with God. Well, last week, we looked at this Old Testament patriarch, Jacob. He was the, the son of Isaac and Rebekah. And he was one of two twins. His older brother, by a few seconds, was Esau. And as they were being born, Jacob, the little baby, grabbed hold to his brother's heel of his foot. And he came out of his mother's womb, holding on his brother Esau's heel. Therefore, Jacob named him, or uh, uh, Isaac named him Jacob, which means heel snatcher. And it was almost a descriptive term to describe what his life would be like for many years. Somewhat slick, somewhat sly, somewhat conniving, somewhat manipulative. And we saw when he came to manhood, he and his mother, Rebecca, hatched up a clandestine plan whereby he would steal the birthright from the older brother Esau. And they would trick her blind husband, uh, Isaac, Jacob's father. And Isaac would mistakenly bless Jacob instead of blessing Esau. We talked about that on last week. So Jacob flees from home to save his life, and his mother sends him back to, to her hometown to go back there to be with her brother Laban. And we saw last week as he was journeying to Padan around that Jacob uh, stopped to rest one night and he was asleep. And while he was asleep, he had this vision of God, this vision of a ladder that came down from heaven and angels were descending, ascending on the ladder. And the angel of the Lord, a Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ, stood at the top of the ladder. And Jacob had this marvelous grand vision of God. And in that, in that vision, the angel of the Lord prophesied to Jacob and promised him that he was going to be blessed. 
that his seed would be as innumerable as the, as the sand on the, on the soil, on the dirt, and that the Lord would bless him in a mighty way, and the Lord's presence would be with him. But Jacob was still in a process of developing, and so after having this grand vision of God, Jacob then made a vow in verse 20 of chapter 18. His vow was this, that if God will be with me, he says, if God will be with me in this way, if God will give me bread, if God will grant me clothing, if God will allow me to come back home to my father's house in peace, then will he be my God. And so Jacob sort of cuts this deal, the Lord, that if you'll take care of me, if you'll provide for me, if you'll protect me, if you'll give me provision, if you give me peace, then you will be my God. What Jacob failed to realize is what sometimes you and I fail to realize. God has done a whole lot for us already. Who, do, who, who was he uh, contributing to the fact that he had been provided for all of his life and he's a grown man? He'd already never missed a meal, had never wanted for anything, had worn the finest clothing, had lived in the best type of lodging of the day. His father, Isaac, and his mother, Rebecca, had provided for him. And he recognized the provision through their hands, but he failed to recognize that the provision ultimately came from God. God had already did for Jacob everything that he was wanting God to do for him moving forward. God had even preserved and God had protected his life uh, from being murdered by his brother Esau, who was outraged over the fact that he had swindled him out of the birthright. God had already did everything that Jacob needed for God to do for Jacob to commit his life to the Lord and surrender to the Lord at that point, but he was not ready to do that. He still had a little bit of a crook in him, Deacon Mitchell. He still had just a bit of the conniving deception in him. As a matter of fact, there was still a whole lot in him. So to get it all out of him, God had to send him to the school of hard knocks. So God sends him down to Laban's house and when he arrives, he meets this beautiful maiden as she's coming out to the well to water her father's sheep. A young lady by the name of Rachel, the Bible says that he kissed her and he started to cry. I mean, he had never saw anything like that. The most beautiful creature he'd ever saw on two feet in his life. And he knew that this had to be the prize that God had for him. And then she discloses that she is the the daughter of Laban, he realizes that's his mother's brother, and by providence, God has brought him to the place, the exact place that his mother wanted him to return to. She then takes him to her father Laban, and Laban, of course, is glad to see a bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. He's glad to see his sister's nephew, and he's also glad to see another flunky show up on the ranch. And he sees the great love and devotion that Jacob already has for Rachel. And so Laban says, well, I, I don't want to uh, uh, not pay you a good wage. And so they negotiate a wage. And so uh, Jacob agrees to work for Laban. Now, originally the agreement was supposed to be three years. And then Laban kind of changed it became seven years. So Jacob worked for Laban for seven years for slave wage at the end of the seven-year period. He was supposed to get hand, uh, Rachel can in marriage. But God, sovereignly and providentially, he has Jacob in the school of hard knocks because God knows the only way to get this crook out of him, he's got to go through some things and realize he cannot spend all of his life trying to swindle and trying to negotiate and trying to connive his way through. I'm going to force him to face the demons that lurks on his soul. So after working for Rachel, for seven years, they have this big banquet party with festivity and food and plenty to drink. And then night fell. And, and so the nighttime fell. It was time to consummate the marriage. And, and, uh, and Laban brings the bride to Jacob's tent. And they go in together. And they enjoy the warmth of, of intimate of fellowship with each other. And Jacob wakes up the next morning and he looks beside him and he says, What in the world have I done? Laying beside him is not beautiful Rachel that he had worked seven years for, but laying beside him was Rachel's older sister, Leah. And the Bible is very kind to Leah. The Bible describes her as being tender-eyed, which probably means she was cock-eyed. 
and Jacob turns over, and there is not beautiful Rachel, but cock-eyed and Leah. And Laban had already did an old switcheroo. And Laban got him good and drunk and said, he won't know the difference. And Laban said, no, our custom in our land is that the younger sister cannot marry before the older sister marries. So I tell you what, a nephew, since I love you so much, work for me for seven more years, and then you can have Rachel. The Bible says he loved her so much. He worked, and seven years seemed like a day. And after a seven-year period arrived, he ended up getting the wife that he really wanted, and that was Rachel. But that was just the beginning of challenges for Jacob because uh, Laban cut a deal for him to stay on, and uh, he worked for seven more years, and Laban changed his wages ten times, and he kept on tricking him and conniving him. And finally, Jacob said, I've got to get up out of here. I'm going deeper and deeper in debt. The more I work, the deeper in debt that I'm falling. So he decided it's time for him to leave and go back uh, to his father's house. In the meantime, you have to read those chapters there in uh, Genesis 30 and 31, uh, two of the most dysfunctional chapters in all the Bible. Uh, as uh, Leah has a child and has another child, and, and then uh, Rachel cannot have children, so she hands her, sends her handmaid in to Jacob to uh, bear children for her. And now you got this whole deal going on of surrogate motherhood. And then Leah realizes that, well, I ain't got enough children, so she sent her handmaid in to Jacob so she can have kids. And before you know it, the Jacob got children by four different women, and they're all trying to live in the same place. It's a dysfunctional mess. And you talk about tension and anger and rivalry that's going on. And so Jacob say, I got to have, I got all these kids, and these slash two wives plus two surrogate wives, and I can't have this man steal all of my money. So he decides to leave. He has to do it in the cover of darkness because he knows that La Jacob Laban won't really let him go. And so in the meantime, Jacob has had another vision of God, and God shows him how I'm going to bless you. Jake, uh, Laban is trying to trick you, but you're going to end up with much of the cattle, much of the livestock. And you can read how that all came about with the deal that they had. If the uh, livestock came out one color, then Jacob got them. If it came out a different color, Laban got them. And every time that Laban would cut that deal, that they would always come out in Jacob's favor. And so God was showing that I've taught Jacob his lesson, and that is the only way to, uh, you can't out crook an old crook until the old crook dies, but the Lord teaches Laban a lesson that you just can't keep crooking everybody. And so then at the end of the day, Jacob ends up prevailing in this deal, and he leaves under cover of darkness. Laban tries to force him to come back, but God speaks to Laban and says, don't touch him, keep your hand off him. So now Jacob is on his way back to his father's house. On his way back to his father's house. By this time, he has two wives, two concubines, and 11 children and a whole caravan of livestock and a few hired servants to help him get all of this livestock back to his father's house. And so as they're journeying back, Jacob gets a disturbing message, a disturbing message. He sends his servants out on a reconnaissance mission, and they go out on this reconnaissance mission, and they come back and they tell Jacob, Jacob, you never will forget what we just encountered. Your brother Esau is coming right this way, and he has 400 men with him of military might, and he's coming your way. And now Jacob is trembling in his bootstraps, and he believes that maybe what goes around is now coming back around, and he's going to have to deal with his angered, outraged brother that he had swindled out of the birthright over 21 years earlier. And Jacob would just imagine with himself, had he done to me what I did to him that I would want to exact revenge. And Jacob knows what he's gone through all those 21 years he's been dealing with Laban, and he can't even imagine what Esau had been going through. But in his mind, Esau had probably been stewing over and over how his younger brother and his own mother had sold him out for the birthright. And Jacob was convinced that if he gets his hands on me, he is going to rip me apart, which he promised to do when I left home 21 years earlier. So now he's trying to, to hatch up a plan, Elder Tolliver. How am I going to deal with my brother? Well, all of the crook isn't out of him yet. He's so materialistic 
he is so uh, focused on material things, so he hatches up a plan. Here's what I'll do. I got hundreds of livestock. I will put together a peace offering, and I will send Esau some cattle and some ram and some livestock, and I will send it to him as a peace offering, and I will send my servants to say, this is a gift from your brother Jacob. And Jacob, Esau, maybe he will accept this peace offering, realize that I've, I've changed, I'm sorry for what I've done, I can't go back and undo it, I've been in a strange land, I haven't even been in the native land, and maybe he will accept this. Then he says, well, here's what I also do, I, I'll, I'll, take, uh, I'll take Leah's uh, handmaid, and I'll put them out front, <laughs> and then I, I'll put the, the other Rachel's handmaid, I'll put them out front, and then I'll keep Rachel and Joseph in the back. And that just by chance, just maybe after he done mold down everybody, he'll have mercy and he won't kill Rachel and Jacob, Joseph, and me. So that's his plan. He, he thought, thought about it. He thought about it quite a while. And so verse 21 of chapter 32, he says, so, so went the present over before him. And you can back up in chapter 32 and read everything he sent to Esau, all of these gifts of livestock and clothes and all this stuff he sent. So, so went the present over before him and himself lodged that night in the company. He's only all by himself now. He's all with his thoughts, with his memory, with the guilt that he's still dealing with from how he had deceived his blind father, how he had robbed his older brother out of the birthright. And now he has wives and children and livestock that he don't think he's going to be able to enjoy because he thinks his life is going to be cut down in the prime of life as the judgment of God finally catches up with him for his dastardly deeds. So he lays down to try to get some rest before having to face the judgment on the following day. Verse 22 says, and he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his eleven sons and passed over before Jabbok. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And Jacob was left alone. And there he wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. Out of nowhere, somebody shows up and jumps on him. <laughs> and Jacob is in this hand-to-hand -hand fisticuff, this wrestling match with this man that he, he doesn't know who it is, and he's not sure, is it someone that Esau is possibly seeing? Why did this one person show up to wrestle me? And they wrestle in this hand-to-hand -hand combat all night long. And then Jacob senses that maybe this is an angelic being. Maybe this is a messenger from God. And he then says to him, Jacob says to him, uh, as he's wrestling with him, and when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hell of his thigh. This angelic being realized he could not prevail against Jacob. Jacob was so tenacious in this wrestling match Jacob wouldn't let him go. He cleaved or clave so tightly to him that finally the angelic being touched him in such a way that dislocated his thigh. Verse 25, and when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of his, uh, uh, Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the daybreak. So the angelic creature said, let me go before the day breaks. I was dispatched, but I've got to return to the heavens before the day breaks. And then Jacob says, I will not let you go except you bless me. Jacob now realized that this is a messenger of God, and that this messenger of God not only has the supernatural power of God, but the anointing of God, and this messenger can do for me what only God can do for me. This messenger can bless me. And I'm at a point in my life where I think, I anticipate that I will face death on tomorrow, 
that my family may face death on tomorrow. I need a blessing from God. I need a move from God. And this is where the preachers get this from, my brothers and sisters. This text right here, when they say sometimes you got to enter your prayer closet, you must grab hold to the horns of the altar, and you must cry out to God and plead with God that he will bless you and that you're not going to let go until the Lord blesses you. Jacob has this. This, this is not a vision. This is a real experience that he's having, wrestling with the angel of God, wrestling with a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. Verse 27, and he said unto him, what is thy name? So the angelic being asked Jacob what his name was. Now this is a play on words here. If this being has come from heaven, if this being has come from the very presence of God, God would have dispatched the being, and the being would not have known who Jacob was unless he was told who Jacob was. In this case, of course, this is the omniscient Christ in the Old Testament. He knew exactly who he was wrestling with. So you said, this preacher, why would the angel ask Jacob his name? The angel is asking Jacob his name because the angel wants the Jacob to confess. I'm a crook. I'm a hill snatcher. I'm a shyster. I'm a con man. I've taken advantage of every situation I could take advantage of. And so for the one last time, God wants to hear Jacob to pour out his soul and articulate his name to acknowledging all that he has been all of his life. But now he has this God encounter. He has this opportunity to change before he dies. Listen to me. He has an opportunity to change. Jacob has an opportunity to change before he, Jacob, thinks he's going to die. Jacob thinks he's going to die the next day. And so the angel of God say, you better come clean with God now. You better confess who you are now. You better confess your sins to God now because your soul is getting ready to be ushered out into eternity. So Jacob acknowledged, I'm Jacob, a low-down crook, a con man, a shyster who deceived his dying blind daddy who swindled his older brother out of the birthright. That's exactly who I am. That's exactly who I am. And I may have went down there and been able to negotiate, and ultimately I went, won a negotiating match with an old crook, Laban, but I'm still a crook myself. And so in acknowledging who he was, listen to this, my brothers and my sisters, he could have said, I'm Laban. He could have gave some false name, but Jacob, now, now was not the time to be, to be slick and to try to be smart. You're dealing with the, the heavenlies here, so he acknowledges who he is. And watch what the angel does. And he says, and he said, thy name shall no more be Jacob. That's what you were, and that's what you have been. But what you have gone through and what you endured, and the way you endured it, and the dignity and integrity that you showed in dealing with your uncle Laban, and your persistence and your tenacity, and your willingness to come clean to realize, I deceived my brother, I've got to repent, I owe my brother something, my brother's entitled to something for the way I treated him. You're now acknowledging all that you've done has been wrong before God. And now you're ready for your name to be changed. Thy name shall be called no more Jacob. You're no more crook, no more shyster, no more swindler, no more con man, no more a gigolo. But Israel, uh, help me, Lord Jesus. But Israel, for as a prince, thou hast power with God and with men and hast prevailed. From here on out, when God utters your name, God is going to call you Israel, the exact opposite of what you was before. You are a prince, a champion. You prevailed against God. And then, of course, None of us can actually prevail against God. What the angel was saying that 
your sincerity and your passion and your desire to be blessed by God has not gone unnoticed. You have prevailed with God. You are an Israel. Israel, you are a prince. You are a champion. You're going to be the father of a whole nation. And thus God plants the seed on this night dealing with a crook, a shyster, dealing with a con man, and God decides that he's now going to start a new nation with one man and his 11, soon to be 12 children. Now you think about that. If this text doesn't give people hope that there was a future for them if they would surrender their lives to the Lord, this man who did some pretty bad things, this man who ch had children by four different women. And part of that was something that he had negotiated because no one put a gun to his head and said he had to sleep with the two women that weren't his wives, but he willingly did it at the coercion of his wives. This man's family situation is quite dysfunctional. And it's going to get more dysfunctional as we move through the biblical text. What am I trying to tell you? God does not select us because we qualify. God does not anoint us because we deserve it. God does not use us because he's so hard up, he got to use us because there's no one else. God calls us, selects us, anoints us, sets us apart, and uses us because he just want to do it. Because he wants to do it. And he uses whom he wants to use, and many that he will use, we will look at them and we will say, they're not qualified. But God looks at them and says, nobody is qualified. But anybody is qualified that I choose it because I qualify. I qualify them based on what it is I'm going to do and based on the power, strength, wisdom, intellect, intelligence, and ability I'm going to give them. So they become qualified, not because they were voted into office by some majority or by some. They're qualified because I chose them. That's what makes them qualified. So God now selects Jacob to be this patriarch, to be the father of the nation. One more point and we'll close. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. Don't worry about what my name is, Jacob. Just be thankful that you got a new name. That you haven't been cut off. That everything that God promise to you that he's going to bring it to pass. And everything that God had promised to him, he was already starting to bring to pass. He took him down into the crook house, Laman, the, the Laban, the old crook. And God provided for Jacob from Laban's provision. God protected Jacob while he was in Laban's house. God now brings him up out of Laban's house. He comes out with livestock, with cattle, with all types of material possession and two wives, two concubines, and 11 children. So God has already blessed him, and now when it comes to this final thing that he progressed God to do, that the Lord would grant him peace to return to his father's house. And we don't have time to look at all of this, but I strongly encourage you to read chapter 33. It's, it's one of the most beautiful chapters in the Old Testament record. Beautiful chapter. J J Jacob still is concerned about this encounter with Esau. And when he finally gets to him, and, and, and Esau said, what is all this cattle? What's all this land? What is all of this? And Jacob says, it's a present for you, my brother. It's a present for you. And Esau said, God has blessed me. God has given me cattle and livestock. God has given me everything that I needed. I forgot all about what you did to me because God has blessed me. And he fell on his brother and he wept and he kissed his brother. And the last big wish that God had acted, let me come back home to peace. And what he was saying, let me be reconciled to my brother. 
I don't like being estranged from my brother. The fact that my brother has so much hatred that he wants to kill me. And God had been working through Esau's heart while he was doing what he was doing. And God was working through Jacob's situation. And even though Jacob had not come to the point to where he could realize he's getting forgiven, God had already worked it out. And God blessed him and God gave him exactly what he had requested. And now Jacob is ready for God to be his God. God was already his God. <laughs> he was already God's servant. He was already the one, one that God had chosen to be the father of the Jewish nation. God had already chosen him for that. And God already had all these blessings in store for him. All it took was Jacob to get to that point to realize, now God, you're going to be my God. And God said, well, I'm glad you are acknowledging that great story, a true story, of how God takes a crook, a heel snatcher, a swindler, a shyster, a con man, and God and starts a nation. So that message for us this morning, my brothers, is that it's never too late for us to yield to God and let God use us to do what he wants to do, the way he wants to do it. And let us not underestimate God's ability to use us because we disqualify ourselves because of the shortcomings and the frailties that we know that exist in our lives and we always will have uh, enough people to keep pointing all those things out to us and if we're not careful we will start believing that people's opinion of us is greater than God's call for us. We will keep thinking that our ability to be used by God is based on our qualifications and our credentials rather than God's sovereign choice, his sovereign design before there was a foundation of the world or when or where or there. God set his love upon us and God preordained and predestined that we'll be born in a certain time in history under certain situations and circumstances, be grown raised in certain environments, some dysfunctional, some mostly dysfunctional, but by the grace of God come to save in Christ in Jesus Christ and have emotional scars, psychological scars, spiritual scars, and even physical scars on our bodies, but they still cannot revoke the call of God. They cannot revoke what God has called you to do and destined you to do and equipped you to do and has anointed you to do, and God will do inside and through you. And you will enjoy it <laughs> if you yield to him. You will enjoy it if you yield to him. And you will sit in awe and say, what a God that could use a rest like me. Isn't that what Timothy said? I mean, what Paul said in Timothy. He said that this is faithful. Paul says, and I think about around about 1 Timothy 1.15, this is faithful and worthy that everybody should accept that Jesus Christ came to save sinners, Paul said. And guess what? I was the chief. I'm the chief sinner, an injurious, a dangerous man, a violent man, persecuting the church, holding Christians out to be beaten and stoned and even incarcerated, holding the coats of those that stoned Stephen and given my approval. And Paul said, but it's pleased God to reveal his son through me. So Paul said, if God would choose me, the chief sinner, the chief antagonist, the chief persecutor of the church, if he would choose me to be one that would preach the gospel and share the gospel, I'm an example of what God can do. So don't disqualify yourself, and don't let others disqualify you from being used by God to do something significant, to bring people into God's kingdom, and to be a blessing to people. Amen? There's a story, and I wish I could remember all the details. And President Abraham Lincoln had a lot of critics they talked about he was tall and gangly. He was not very handsome. And he was country because he was down in Kentucky and he moved to Illinois. 
and he had lost political offices and hadn't been very successful as a lawyer, and now he gets elevated to be the president of these United States of America at the most critical time in the nation's history, the Civil War. As a matter of fact, when he's elected, the South said, no, we gonna not going to let, he's not going to rule over us because they feared that he would take on slavery and try to end institutions. And they asked Lincoln about one of his chief critics, whom Lincoln later appointed him to be in his cabinet. And they said, well, Mr. Lincoln, what do you think about this person? And Lincoln went on to extol his intellect, his service, his virtue, his credentials, his qualifications. The man said, well, Mr. Lincoln, I mean, you, you're talking so in such favorable terms, in, in such flattering terms about, about this person, but, but here's what he think about you. And Lincoln said, you asked me what I thought about him, <laughs> and not what he thought about me. It's what I thought about him, not what he thought about me. And so we must keep our focus on what it is that God thinks about us and what it is that God wants us to do not what other people think about us. Amen? Let's bow, shall we?